Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, welcome to another Wednesday night Bible study. Welcome to the uh, Wednesday night crew. And we've been talking about prayer. And we're going to pick up right where we left off. We, we, we started last week talking about how prayer gives heaven consent. We talked about the two prayers that God will never answer. Number one, he'll never answer a prayer where you're asking him to do what he's already done. Number two, he'll never answer a prayer where he's asking, where, where we're asking him to do something that he's already told us to do. And we began to really spend time um, last week on uh, moving into communion. And that's what we're calling this series, Prayer into Communion, because we believe that prayer is a loving, communing relationship with God. It's not something that's just scheduled. It's something that we live. And so I, uh, I want to start off with something that just really talks of the character of God. You know, when you think of God, you think, well, you know, he should show up in a big chariot, showing up in a comet coming down. But in the book of Matthew, chapter 11 and 29, pay very close attention to this lesson today. The Lord delights in using subtle ways to reveal himself. Subtle ways to reveal himself. And um, he could have manifested in a much more glorious manner when he came to the earth. I mean, think about it. Uh, coming to the earth, lying in a manger. I mean, listen, it could have been a, a, a huge dramatic event. You know, he could have written in on a comet and landed on the top of the temple at midnight. The earth could have shook. It could have, lightning would have flashed. Thunder would have, you know, turned into like a rap music. But it, he's subtle. Realize this about God. It's not like some of the uh, movies we see. God is, you know, you know when I say God does things secretly and quietly? He's subtle. He's secret. He's quietly. Not a secret from you, but look at this scripture. I, I believe this defines his character. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Um, uh, Matthew uh, eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. There it is. Jesus, he said of himself, he says, I'm meek and I'm lowly. I, I think we need to be, agree with that. Lord, help us to be meek and lowly like you. He says, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And here's what you learn of him. I am meek and lowly. God is not as dramatic as, as some preachers are. He is meek and he is lowly. He is a subtle. God is subtle. And so the Lord delights in using subtle ways to reveal himself. You know, I can remember I had an injury in my back and, you know, I had already thanked God for it and believed that I received it. And the pain was still there, but, but I would spend more time paying attention to what God said versus the pain. And right along, you know, uh, the, the end of that week or something like that, he had to remind me, you notice your back getting hurting? And I'm like, wow, sure did. See, it wasn't some, some gigantic lightning bolt that hit and said, now your back is healed. He did it subtly because he's meek and, and he's lowly. It, it's the same way when you begin to look at your, your needs in your life. Okay, so it, it wasn't that you went to the mailbox and there in the mailbox and the trumpets were playing and you opened the envelope up and bam, there was a million dollar check. But you know what God does? Just bit by bit, everything's taken care of. Just, just at the end of the day, everything's taken care of. And before you know it, several months has gone by and that whole dilemma is no longer there. Why? Because he is meek and lowly. He is subtle in revealing himself. And that really ministers to me because 
I, I'm not looking for the, the big drama in the heavens for God. I'm looking for a meek and subtle God, a, a God who is meek and subtle. And I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that meek and subtle God showing up in my life, doing something so magnificent in my life. And so the Lord is not, you know, spectacular in, in just a lot of things he does. He is spectacular, don't get me wrong, but he's meek and he's lowly. And that's what this scripture says to me. So we need to learn how to fellowship with God in the midst of our everyday life. We got, and, and that's the key. How do I fellowship with God? How do I commune with God in the midst of my everyday life? In the midst of a job that I have to go to? In the midst of people that I have to deal with that may not be safe people? In the midst of situations that uh, are, are not very comfortable situations at home or in relationship? We've got to learn how to fellowship with God in the midst of everyday life. See, that's the key to it. Not, not going away for 30 days and going to fasting and prayer, and there's nothing wrong with that. But how do I relate with him in the midst, in the midst of my everyday life? He's subtle, but in the midst of my everyday life. That's the goal. That's, that's the objective that we want to achieve, is how to relate with him in the midst of my everyday day life. Now you think about the things you have going on every day in your life. How do I relate with it? How do I pay attention to that subtle God in my everyday life? So at the end of the day, and I, I talk to him, he's talking to me about my day. I'm talking to him about my day. And even while I'm talking to him, I realize, oh, wow, you were there. You did that. Oh, I didn't even realize. Yeah, that, that didn't happen. Well, you notice that person that was treating you real bad, they were treating you. Not. I, ain't, I didn't notice that God I started saying, I ain't even noticed that. I didn't notice that God. But that's how he is. And it's time for us to learn how to fellowship with him. Now, uh, I want to show you something because I've, I've seen this in, in, in churches and even in my own life where I thought I had to really beg God uh, and I had to bombard heaven in order to get God to, to, to do something for me. Is that true? Do I have to knock the gates of heaven down and go in there and holler and scream and, and bombard heaven in order for God to do something? Is that the truth? I just told you his character. And that's why I started off with this because this is so important. We're going to study out of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Let me turn there. And uh, we're going to look at how this, this subtle God shows up. And is it true that we have to, to uh, bombard heaven? And I'm telling you, I don't have to beg God. I don't have to plead with God. And, and, I, and I thought at one time you did. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to start right now. You don't have to beg God. You don't have to plead with God. And a lot of times, that's just showing something else different. It's like, why are you begging and pleading with God? And, and I've seen that. Come on. I used to do that. I, I'm actually, we only do what we know to do until we know better, all right? And so let's look at this uh, story here in Luke chapter 11. And when you get to Luke chapter 11, let's look at verse 1. And we're going to study all the way through this. Verse 1, he says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Verse 2, and he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as, as in heaven, uh, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, he's your friend, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing set before him. And so you go to a friend, right? And he from within 
shall answer and say, so he didn't say it out loud, but on the inside, that's what he was thinking. Trouble me not. The door is not, uh, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed and I cannot rise and give thee. Verse eight, he said, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. What is that? Importunity. It means when you beg someone to do something. That's basically what it is. Importunity. It's the persistence in solicitation. It's when you beg someone to do something. You're persistent at asking and asking and begging and pleading. Importunity. So he says, uh, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. All right, now notice what he said. He says, he, you showed up and you asked a friend to do it, but he said he didn't want to do it on the inside. And he said, you had to beg him. You had to plead with him to do this thing. All right. Now, let's, let's pause here just for a moment. Now, this passage is commonly taught that God is like this friend. That's how, that's how we're commonly hearing it. God is like this friend. You must go to him when you have a need. But when you first ask for it to be met, he may answer no. He may answer not now or he may answer. I'm not ready. And therefore, you must stay after God. You you got to badger God. You got to badger him and you got to be persistent in praying your request over and over and over again until you make him give you what you need. And then basically, you must bombard the gates of heaven until they open. That's how it's been taught. That's not at all what Jesus is talking about here. Please pay very close attention to what he's talking about here. What Jesus is saying is, if you were my real friend, I wouldn't have to beg you. <laughs> if you were my real friend, all I have to do is ask and you would do it. He said, you wouldn't have to beg a real friend. You wouldn't have to plead with a real friend. And, and, and this is, this is uh, more of, of a contrast of what a real friend is should be versus a comparison. And Jesus says, you know, if a real friend should respond without begging and pleading, then how much more do you think I should respond? You see how the church took that whole thing around and said, hey, we got to be just like this man. We got to show up and beg and plead. And if you say no, we got to keep begging and pleading. If you say not now, we got to keep begging and pleading. But don't stop begging. Don't stop pleading until you get what you want. And the church starts shouting over. And that ain't at all what he's talking about. He said, if you were a friend, begging and pleading is not required. You would do it. He says, I'm more than a friend. And so, so, so how do I know he's saying this? Look at the next verse in verse 9. Look at what he says. He said, when he said that, he said, I, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and, 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 and the door shall be open. You know what Jesus is saying? You, you're not, you don't need to beg and plead with me like this guy did. I'm a real friend. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. You don't have to plead and bombard heaven and beg and all that kind of stuff. He says a real friend, a real friend would know to respond to a friend. And Jesus is saying, I'm a real friend. None of that is required when you come to me. Oh, my goodness. None of that's required when you come to me. And then look at verse, uh, the next verse. Uh, uh, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be open to him. He says, because I'm, I'm more than a friend. I'm more than a friend. I'm going to do this thing without you begging. And go on to the next verse. He says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? He says, so look at a father and a son's relationship. He says, a, a real father's not going to give you a stone when you need fish to eat. Will he for, for fish give him a serpent? No, not a real father. And God is, 
God is more than a father. God is more than a friend. You don't have to beg him. So this thing that we do in prayer all night long, I don't even know how people do it. I used to do it, and I used to fall asleep, and I thought, well, I'm not a good Christian because I'm tired and, and I'm hungry. And, 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 and I, I realized the day I, I don't ever have to beg God. He's my friend. He's my friend. He is delighted. He said, you remember the Bible says that he's delighted to give us the keys to the kingdom? It is his pleasure to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It is the Father's pleasure to give you the keys to the kingdom. I want you to, stop. I want you to erase that. And, and I know a lot of people have been taught that. Let's just bombard heaven. Let's just beg God. Let's just plead with God. No. Ask. He'll answer. Seek. You're going to find. Knock. The door is going to open. He'll treat you better than the father would treat his son. This is what this prayer is about. That you know you have a Jesus, a God who is meek and lowly and who's ready to respond to you. And in some cases, like I said, I believe it was last week, some cases God will answer you before you ask. He'll open the door before you knock. You will find it before you seek because that's what happens in that communion. In the developing of a relationship and the developing through that communion, God's doing stuff for you. God's doing stuff for you. And so I hope you got a hold of that. So if a friend would treat you better than this, why would you think God must be begged and, why, and pleaded with to meet your need. God loves you. God died for you. God gave his son for you. Look at this scripture, Romans chapter 8, 32. Look at it in the King James and then the New Living Translation. Oh my goodness. It, what a relief to know that I don't have to beg God. What a relief to know that I don't have to bombard the gates of heaven. What a relief to know. And, and then you, you have to think about what, you know, People in these intercessory groups, they're just begging and pleading with God. And man, I go in and do in two minutes what they're trying to do in 24 hours. When you know him and you're communing with him. Look at what he says. says, he that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All right, so here's what he's saying. I gave you my son. I gave you the most valuable thing heaven had to offer. Seriously, you think I'm going to withhold something from you? You think I'm going to hold this little thing from you when I gave you my son? You think I'm going to hold healing from you when I gave you my son? I'm going to withhold deliverance from you when I gave you my son. I'm going to withhold favor from you when I gave you my son. In a lot of cases, God wants you to have it more than what you want it. Look at this in the Amplified. I mean, excuse me, the, uh, in the NLT. He says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? <laughs> That's powerful. He, he, gave, he, he, he made Jesus available to us. I like what he says here. Won't he also give us everything else? That is so good. That is so good. Won't he always give us everything else? Now, let me show you where and why communion with God and communion with his word is very important. Because if you just start preaching to people that their motivation is pleasing self, then they're going to always be asking for the wrong thing. They're going to always ask God something that's going to satisfy themselves. And, and that's why when you're communing with God, you, you allow the Holy Spirit to come in and change your desire. The Bible talks about that, that the Spirit of God will come and change your desire to do what pleases God. Uh, and, 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 and to change your desire, there's a scripture that says, uh, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be given. Here's the key. Abiding in the word is going to, to uh, uh, in a sense, correct your, uh, your, your asking. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to govern your asking. By me spending time in the word... Whatever I thought I would ask maybe 10 years before that, I spent so much time in that word that my asking now has been, has been changed. And I'm now asking according to his will. I, I didn't know. I thought, I thought, well, 
give me a car, give me this. All of that was me asking what brings pleasure to me. But what about going to God and say, God, I want to know clearly what I've been put here to do and equip me with everything I need so that I can be successful in accomplishing the will of God for my life. And then all those other things come behind that. Ah, that's so important. That's so important. And since he gave you his son, he's not going to give you everything else? He's not going to give you everything else? We have to be careful not to put ourselves in the center of this relationship with God. It's got to be about him and not about you. Prayer is as much about the right attitude and the right motivations than the right volume and the right posture. We spend so much time on the posture and the volume. Should my hands be uh, folded? Should I be on my face? You know, how long should I do this? How long should I do that? He gave you Jesus. He will give you everything else. That really, really blessed me to know that God loves me so much that he will cause that to happen. So the whole point of this parable is that God won't treat you like this. That's the whole point of the parable. God is not going to treat you the way that that, that guy who was supposed to be his friend treated his, his friend. And that's what that means. It means, it means, I mean, I'm sure the friend was disappointed. Like, dude, you seriously going to make me sit out here and beg you and plead with you uh, instead of just coming and helping me out? God won't treat you like that. That's awesome. And that gives me great, great, great desire to want to praise the Lord because I know I got a God that won't treat me like that. And so contrast, you know, that I, I believe that was a contrast being made. It means to compare in order to show unlikeness or differences. And that's what this was. It was showing and comparing in contrast this friend uh, versus God being the friend. And that's what he was showing. I'm comparing God's friendship to you versus this guy's friendship to his guy. And God was like, I'm going to be the friend that won't treat you like that friend. And so to, it, it means to exhibit unlikely, unlikeliness on comparison with something else. That's what this is about. So it took the achievements of Christ to really rescue my mind from the lies it's believed, to rescue my mind from the lies. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It took the achievements of Christ to rescue my mind from all the lies that I believed, and, and especially the lies that we've believed about prayer. I, I want you to think about this as we come near a close. You know, the last three, four weeks we've been talking about this, have you been able to identify the lies that you've been told about prayer? You know, uh, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That, that's an amazing thing to me, that uh, the excellency of the power is not of me. It, 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 it took the achievements of Christ to rescue my mind from the lies that is believed. And, and God lives on the inside of me. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and uh, it's not of us, it's of him. And then, and then look at this scripture, uh, Ephesians 1 and 19. Faith reveals how enormous, how enorm, norm, 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 excuse me, how really big. <laughs> It's enormous in our lives, the advantage that we've been given in Christ. Enormously uh, uh, advantage. We are, we are advantaged uh, in an enormous way because of what Jesus Christ has already done. I had to get my, my mouth open. Now, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. Keep going. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. I believe I received that right now. And so you have access to all of that. 
uh, all of that's been made available to you. You have been tremendously advantaged because of what Jesus has done. So now how do we, how do we commune with him? How do we take time to go before the Lord and, and say, God, I want to get to know you. I wrote a book uh, some time ago called Answers Awaiting in the Presence of God. And I knew when God called me to pastor this church, we started with like eight people. And I remember my father, when he was alive, he asked, well, you know, where are the people going to come from? I mean, how are you going to do this? And I said, I don't know. God will tell me. And it was, it was, it was just so strange in his face. You're like, well, you know, you can hear from God. Yeah, I can. He'll tell me what to do. And, and I was a fanatic about this. I just wouldn't do anything unless I got it in prayer. And I spent an enormous time in prayer, developing my relationship with God developing my hearing so that I can hear from God and so that I would know what to do. And I remember when the Lord said to me, you got to be a barefooted priest. Uh, and, and that just simply meant don't just go to walk in, in, in every field, you know, be sensitive to every step that you take. And, and so God began to, to lead me and he began to speak to me, you know, how to build a church and, and make sure that this church is founded on prayer Make sure you teach people how to commune with me because when you're not there in their homes and in their lives and on their jobs, I'm there. And if you'll teach them how to commune with me and walk with me, then I can teach them how to walk. And he did. And, and, and my motto was real clear. Every failure in life is a prayer failure. And I challenge people to look at your life and wherever you're failing, ask yourself, are you failing in prayer and communion right there in that area? And I was slow as a snail at getting things done, but I wanted to make sure that I was about doing what I believe God told me to do. Now, if I missed it, and I did miss it a lot, at least I missed it, you know, trying to get what God told me to do. And then every time I missed it, I'd bump into God and he'd show me how to correct it and get out of it. Um, and still to this day, especially uh, throughout these days of pandemic, it's, it's been back to that again. How do we do this, Lord? When do we do it, Lord? How long do we do it, Lord? When do we come back to church? How do we do it when we come back to church? And God's just taking care of all of that stuff bit by bit by bit. And it's something that it, it brings me great joy to know that God wants to answer. He wants to give. He wants to open the doors. You're not, you're not struggling trying to convince him to do something he already wants to do. So if you can see this very clearly, prayer is all about relationship. Prayer is all about building relationship. And we are in this for the relationship. My heart goes out to a guy who's not doing what he's doing out of a relationship with God. It, doing, he's not doing what he's doing out of wanting to know God. His motives are completely selfish. His motives are about his image. It's about all this other kind of stuff. It's, it's amazing to me. It, it's like, you, I, don't even, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it because I'm in it for him. And if he's out the picture, it ain't no use me doing this. You know, I might as well die and go, on, be with, go, go on to heaven or something if he's not in the picture. If, if church and if ministry is all about just me, what? Uh, that, 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 you know, uh-uh. It's got to be bigger than that, and, and, and God makes it bigger than that. It, it, God's stuff is a whole lot bigger than our stuff. It's, you start seeking him and his plans and what he's going to do, so much bigger than, you know, what people are thinking about me, what people are saying about me, what I got, what I'm driving. Come on, dude. If, if that's all it is to your prayer life and your relationship, we need to pray for you. But I'm just believing that that's not all it is. And I pray that our teaching tonight has helped you to understand that you don't need to beg God. You don't need to plead with him. All is well. God wants to be a good friend to you, an amazing father to you. He wants to be in a relationship with you that you talk to him and he talks back to you. This is what I've been trying to convey where this is concerned. Now, on our next 
next session, we're going to deal with speaking in tongues, lay a foundation for that. And then I'm going to show you how to pray in the spirit. I'm going to show you about something called groanings in the spirit. And then I'm going to show you five amazing things that uh, are a result of spending time praying in the spirit. I believe the top way of fellowshipping with God is in the spirit. And when most Christians realize that, the devil won't have a chance. Father, we thank you tonight for our opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. I pray that they have gained understanding, knowledge from the word of God, and I pray that their prayer life is increasing more and more. I pray your blessings upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Now, again, I'll never take it for granted that somebody may be watching and that they, they may need Jesus as Lord and personal Savior. I, that's another thing God does. I, I, I don't have any idea how God draws people to this stream. And they, they show up and they want to be a part, not just our members, our church members, but people from everywhere. And I don't know who you are, but maybe you're not born again. And maybe tonight the Spirit of God convinced you that now's the time to get saved. Would you pray with me by repeating this prayer after me? Say, Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner. But right now, I repent of all of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. And so by faith, I declare that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to uh, text this keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Now, if you'll send me your name and email address, I'm going to send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. And I want to say congratulations and welcome to the kingdom of God. Go in the comment section and, and tell people, I just got saved. I, got, I just got saved. And, and I'm going to ask the World Changes Nation, you rejoice with those people and congratulate them for the move they just made. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's an opportunity to worship God with your gifts. I believe that your worship is not complete without gift giving. And as we continue to give, we understand that we don't give out of necessity. In other words, somebody says, you got to give in order to be blessed. No, I'm already blessed. That's why I'm giving. And somebody says, well, you know, you got to give in order to have victory in your life. Well, Jesus has already made the victory available through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, and I'm giving as uh, gratitude and thanksgiving for the victory that has already been made available to me. That's why it's important to uh, involve the gift giving and giving as a part of your worship. It's an honor. It's an honor act. As, as we give to God that which actually he's given to us. You know, all things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have I given thee. So actually what you have and you're sitting to consider whether or not you're going to give, he gave it to you. And it's one of those, I see it as a test. Will I give back to God that which he put in my hands in the first place? Will I take what God has given me and use it to worship him in the first place? And so the Bible says we don't give out of necessity. We give out of a cheerful heart, a heart of gratitude and love and thanksgiving. So uh, as you decide to give tonight, if you want to use the text technology, you can text world changes and the world changes space and the amount to 74483. You can dial the number on your screen, 866-477-7683. You can also give online, crippledollarministries.org or worldchanges.org. Or you can uh, mail it to 2500 Burdett Road here in College Park, Georgia. And we will pray and believe God for your massive return. And I just thank God that financial breakthroughs are taking place in your life still. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, we're going to stay in, the, in this. It's going to be amazing. You stay connected. Uh, share with other people. Get them to be a part of what we're learning. And we are going to see the recovery of this world and our nation because we are people who know how to pray and commune with God. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.